Hopefully we can't find the microphone to fix something. <laughs> the <jet. laughs> um, thank you for coming. I know it's a bit chilly, but we're glad you're here. I'm sure more people will come once they get used to snow. So tonight we have um, homegrown harvest, and we have um, Tisa Nollis who will be presenting small um, in-home gardening. So if you're looking for fresh fruit and vegetables, I'm sure that this is the place to do that. Also, uh, we have a donation box in the back. everybody for coming out tonight. Um, if anybody did not get a handout, Mark, um, let's just make sure I'll put them over here so you can direct people. Did you get a handout? So I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Uh, the weather has been quite awful, but 31 days till spring. So <laughs> we just need to think of it that way. Um, my name is Christine Segalis. I'm with the Homegrown Harvest. My partner, Ma Mark Galke, and I are here tonight to, um, to share some ideas on uh, small space gardening, container gardening in specific. Uh, to give you a little background about myself, uh, I've been a container gardener for most of my <laughs> life. I grew up in Manhattan. Uh, my mother was an avid gardener, and if there was a sunny window, which we had a few of them, there was as many containers as you could put in the window. Um, growing up in, uh, during the summers in, in Sherman, Connecticut, uh, I gained my love of uh, gardening uh, vegetables. And in the course of my life, I've raised uh, two kids here in New Canaan for the past 20 years. They're in college now. And uh, for 14 years, I was a market research analyst with my brother who ran a hedge fund. My focus was on agribusiness, food, and water stocks. After doing that with him, kind of living his dream, I wanted to start my own business. And Mark and I had known each other 25 years earlier, and we'd gotten together. We'd worked together 25 years ago at the two radio stations in Stanford, uh, 96.7 and 1400 STC, when it was STC. Is it still STC? No. Um, so we decided to... Uh, start Homegrown Harvest. And it was really with the thought that we wanted to help people grow their own food and um, give them some simple solutions to, so that they could do that. Uh, a lot of people feel that in order to grow food, they need you know, tons of acres and all this space, and <coughs> it's really not the case. Um, you can grow you know, great salads and, and wonderful vegetables, even if you have just a small terrace and, and um, or an apartment. So that's what tonight's discussion is about. Um, I have to work two things here, so please forgive me. Um, so small space gardening, container gardening allows us to maximize our small spots wherever they may be. We may have a, a weird small sunny spot um, in the yard that uh, could be rocky or perhaps there's, you know, there's <coughs> problems with the soil or we just you know, we want to add some color where there's a lot of green. Um, it could be that you have a lot of hardscape, uh, patio, or perhaps your front entrance is where you get your most sun. So um, containers allow us the flexibility to take advantage of the sunny spots in our yard or wherever they may be. Um, they can allow us to add to already existing gardens and growing space. Um, and say you have a, a, you know, say it's your driveway, that's your sunniest spot, uh, you can still take advantage of the sun and um, dress it up and it will, it will look quite nice. Inside the house, perhaps there's a sunny window um, or a side, uh, um, you know, um, sunroom that you have that needs some brightening up and you can take advantage of the, the sunny uh, southern facing windows and spaces that you have and, and you can grow a good amount of edible um, you know, food that will inspire meals. Starting a garden can be overwhelming for people, uh, but knowing the first few steps will help us all become successful. 
a fertile growing medium, understanding where the sun is, and having the right container size, and giving it the right care are all equally important, which is why I have them on the same line. If you don't have any one of these ingredients, your rate of success will probably be less. Um, if you don't have the right growing medium, your, um, your fruits and vegetables probably will not be as productive and may not flower or produce. If you don't have the right sunlight, you're going to definitely get spindly plants um, that again will not be productive. Um, the right size container, if you're in too small of a container, it, your plant is going to not be able to thrive. And the right care includes the, um, the right amount of watering and pruning uh, to allow aeration, to allow the air through. Um, that keeps away diseases and such. And depending upon where the uh, plant is, I've had plants catch wind just because <laughs> they've been so dense. So you kind of want to let the air get through it. A fertile growing medium is the most important. Our ancestors knew what it took to grow great fruit. And <coughs> in 2009, the American Association of Science, um, they agreed that uh, crops get their nutrients from the soil. And healthy soil leads to higher nutrients in crops. So if you d most of the soil that our farmers, unfortunately, are, are, are farming on these days have been depleted of their nutrients. And um, so a lot of the fruits and vegetables that are in the supermarkets are not as nutrient dense and rich as they were even 20, 30, 40 years ago. According to the scientists, it's a fact that healthy soils are responsible for the production of foodborne vitamins, antibiotics, uh, phytochemicals, and amino acids. And all of these are crucial to human health. The right soil will yield the most nutritious and flavorful food possible. A growing body of research supports the theory that organic pioneers Sir Albert Howard and J.J. Rodale believed in, that soils rich in organic matter produce more nutrient, nutritious food, higher in antioxidants, flavonoids, vitamins, and minerals. Healthy soil is biologically alive and balanced in minerals and carbon content. American farming soils, as I said, have depleted these nutrients. So this is a big problem that we have throughout the world, un unfortunately. And the amount of topsoil um, that we have left that's usable is only about 40 years worth. So um, this is a major problem in our, our agriculture, um, commercial agriculture business, which was, it affects everything that we eat. So for containers in particular, because it's a little bit different than what you would put in the garden bed if you were doing a raised bed. Containers are <coughs> a small contained environment. So we recommend this is our, our formula for what we do. Compost is the food and the nutrient source that's going to feed the food, your, your, um, the growth of the plants. Core, which is coconut fiber, um, it comes compacted and you need to fluff it up but um, it retains water and it loosens the soil. It always will absorb water. So even if core dries out, it can reabsorb water. Um, vermiculite is a rock which is mined and heated into little pieces that have nooks and crannies that help hold the water and nutrients um, as well into the soil. And it's, it's an imperative part of um, setting up a, a, moil, uh, a moist, rich um, soil environment for plants to be able to take root. Um, it also helps keep the soil friable and less dense. And it <coughs> adds a little bit of potassium and, and magnesium, but not enough to um, alter the pH of the soil. We include worm castings as a nutrient-dense addition to the soil. So that's another. Um, place where uh, the nutrients are coming from. So starting with this mix, we've created a weed-free environment that's organically balanced to grow food, um, which is nutrient-dense from the compost and the worm castings, and the moisture retention and the friability, which is how crumbly it is, um, is provided from the core and the vermiculite. So right here, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is 
just solid compost. And if I were to take it out and squeeze it in my hand, it would it'd probably stay pretty dense and, and tighten everything. Um, in combining these ingredients, the core and the vermiculite, what that does is it helps to break up um, the soil so that it's easier for the roots you know, to, to work their way through. And um, as I said, the, uh, the core and the vermiculite help hold the, the water and the nutrients. Because with containers in particular, um, and depending upon the type of container that you choose to use, it will dry out quickly. <coughs> so it's something that needs to be um, a consideration. Sunlight is just as important, and knowing and understanding your sunlight <coughs> um, is, is very important. Food needs sun to grow. Uh, the warmer weather plants, the fruiting vegetables, like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, they need a solid eight plus hours of direct sun. Uh, not indirect sun, direct sun. Vine crops also, like cucumbers <coughs> and squash, also need the eight hours full. full. Um, root vegetables, carrots, beets, six hours. And leafy vegetables, leafy greens, uh, they'll, they'll, they're good with four hours. So um, natural light, it, it, whether you're doing it inside or out, um, so if it's natural or artificial light, it needs to be, those are the requirements that the, the vegetables will need in order to thrive and produce. Um, there's a variety of vegetables and herbs and flowers for every uh, light situation. So there's a garden of uh, flavors for everyone to enjoy. Plants grown inside take longer to grow, but they need less water and less fertilizer because they don't dry out as quickly as outdoor plants. Uh, we can grow indoors all year long, and there's plenty of great edibles which can be grown inside. Herbs, for instance, are very easy. They're less demanding. Uh, Peas are very easy to grow inside because they like cooler temperatures, as is um, greens like lettuce and, and spinach. You want to look for um, bush varieties. So they usually start with a name like dwarf or tiny or, or, or patio or small. Uh, if you're going to grow inside, you want to stay away from vines just because they're going to require a lot of support. Um, so they can, you know. If you're successful, they, they can come really out of control. But that'd be a, a good problem to have, I suppose. Um, the best edibles, um, you can also do radishes. They're very quick growing, as, well, as far as you know, that goes. And you can do small fruiting um, vegetables. It's a little bit of more of a challenge for um, doing inside. You have to have the right amount of light, and uh, it needs to be the right heat, right warmth environment. So. But it can be done. If you, know, if you want to challenge yourself and you've got something to do over the winter, um, it's always fun to try new things. Sprouting is also very d great to do inside. Uh, you can do it 365 days of the year. There's no soil, low light, no weeding. Uh, it doesn't need any space. You get instant gratification, and it's very inexpensive. The nutritional value that you get with sprouting is immense. Uh, it provides a huge amount of nutrients that are delivered in a way that is easily digestible to the human body and um, assimilated, so it improves your digestion. Uh, it's a potent source of antioxidants, which are essential for protecting the body from disease and strengthening your immune system. It's a great source of um, fatty acids, which are missing from a lot of diets. It's an excellent source of fiber and vitamins. Uh, the vitamin density of some seeds can increase from 100 to 2,000 percent after just a few days of sprouting. There are tons of minerals. Uh, the minerals which developed, which developed during sprouting are in, delivered to your body in an easier form for your body to um, use. And it's a great source of protein, low calorie, and low in the glycemic index, and they're always fresh. If you want to look for specially marked uh, seeds for sprouting, they're easy to grow. You simply use a mason jar and a cheesecloth or a little screen on top, uh, so it's easy to rinse. Within five days, you can have fresh sprouts. Uh, 
It's very simple to do. You simply just put in um, the amount of seeds what it says on the packet. You fill it up with water so it's like two inches above um, the seeds. You let them sit for eight hours or overnight. The next day you just toss that water out, you rinse them out, and you um, just let it sit so it's draining, always draining, and um, within a few days, you, you rinse it like every like two or three times during the day. And then you, you have like ter terrific sprouts that you could stick in your sandwiches and your salads, you know, five days later. Most popular seeds used for sprouting, alfalfa, broccoli seeds, red clover, mung beans, fennel greek, uh, lentils, peas, and radish. Sunflower greens are really nutritious. Wheatgrass is an ultimate blood purifier. And grain sprouts are highly recommended. Um, it's the best way for the human body to get grains. <coughs> it, it's the easiest way for our bodies to digest them, um, much better than in breads and cereals and such. Excuse me, may I ask you a question? Sure. When you say about grain uh, sprouts, how do we use them? Do we use the way when it's sprouting? Yeah, just as a, yeah, just when it's as a sprout, and you can put it in a salad as such. So when you're eating sprouts, you're eating the root and all. When you eat microgreens, you're eating baby plants that are harvested by cutting. Um, close to the base. Microgreens um, are very easy to grow. You, you can fill containers of any size um, around them. Uh, you simply just sprinkle seeds on top of the soil. You put a, um, a plastic cover on to get some humidity and you put a cover on it to trap the light. And so it takes a few days for germination. Um, you can put it on a heat mat. If you don't have a heat mat, uh, if you have, um, you know, a, a heating pad or something, you can just put it on that. And within like two days, you should see some, the sprouts will start. And once that happens, you take the cover off and you put it in direct light, either the sunlight or under light. And uh, then it will continue to grow. And within seven days, you'll start to have, you know, your, your, your uh, microgreens and they're, they're ready for harvesting. And you can just harvest them as you need them. Throw them into your salads, your salad, you know, soups or, or whatever. So even though they're very tiny, they're still very nutritious. Y yes, microgreens have a huge um, health benefit in these tiny, immature greens. Uh, scientists have just recently come out with a study from the University of Maryland and the USDA that said that uh, microgreens are four to forty times more concentrated with nutrients than their mature counterparts. So it's, it, it's a highly nutritious, very easy um, uh, plant to enjoy. And, and you can grow it indoors 365 days of the year. Or you can use to grow it outdoors too. I mean, you, you can take the, 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 the plants that you started during the summertime and, and put them outside if you have a deck or a patio. You, so it doesn't have to be inside for microgreens. But they're easy enough that you can enjoy growing them inside. Containers are a great way to grow um, outdoors as well, providing us with the opportunity to use containers in sunny spots on our deck and patio. They're extremely versatile and come in a wide range of shapes, sizes, and materials to choose from. They're easy to control the soil environment, and larger containers can be put on casters and moved around. We recommend self-watering containers. They have a bottom reservoir which help maintain the consistency in the soil better than traditional containers, particularly terracotta ones that tend to dry out very quickly. Self-watering containers come in many shapes and sizes. At the bottom of the container, there's a grill which separates the soil from the water reservoir. This helps to set up a consistently moist and aerated soil environment which is preferred when you're growing vegetables in particular. They're very picky. Um, so you want to look for containers that are at least 12 inches in root depth, particularly for the bigger plants, so that it allows that um, solid root development. And you can grow vegetables of all sorts in containers. So 
It doesn't limit you. But knowing the right size is very important. It depends on the space available and what you hope to grow. So knowing the right size container is key. Small pots and teacups are great for um, shallow rooted um, herbs. Uh, fruiting vegetables need a little bit more space. Uh, so like cherry tomatoes, they can grow in at least a minimum of a, a gallon container, but um, standard tomatoes, heirlooms and such, they need a minimum of a three to five gallon container. The depth of the container is very important, as I said. There's such shallow plants like strawberries and herbs and certain greens that can go into the four to six inch deep planters. Um, six to 12 each, um, 12 inch deep uh, greens and beans. And as I said, the 12 inches or above for fruiting vegetables or root vegetables. You can do root vegetables in planters. It, as long as you have the space, the depth, there's no reason why you can't enjoy having some carrots or um, beets. When we put together uh, containers, we we take the approach that we, when we do square foot gardening. So we look towards companion plants such as herbs and flowers to intermix with the vegetables. We don't just plant the vegetables and leave it at that. Um, companion plants help bring in beneficials and pollinators as well as, um, they just make everything, it just makes the, the, the container look much more, um, much prettier. Keep in mind though, uh, when you're planting, how much each plant, the, the space that uh, each plant will need. So I have a tendency sometimes to overcrowd my planters. Here we have one of the self-watering containers like we have on the table. Um, these containers give you two square feet of space so you can put in um, a pepper and a, a tomato and then mix in with it the herbs and flowers also what you achieve by um, integrating the herbs and the flowers is you also crowding out space where weed seeds could take root. Even though it's in a container, you know, weed seeds fly around and so you can get weeds in, in containers. But <coughs> you've got herbs and flowers in there, there's less of a chance of that happening. In the right size container uh, and the proper placement and care will yield delicious treats. We grew um, in a 20 inch round container, um, we seeded uh, a couple of icebox uh, watermelons. So in the right spot, it, and we knew it was gonna come out, so I left the space so that it could trail out. Um, and they were quite delicious. Fabric containers are another option, like smart pots. Uh, they're made of a breathable fabric that allows for the roots to breathe and can be, um, the roots can actually root into the ground. So if it's on, you know, part of your lawn, um, it can actually take hold into the lawn, but it also works just as well on a patio or a hardscape. Um, they're wonderful for storing. Uh, in the off season, you just dump out the nutrient um, depleted soil and fold it up. I like to use them for, um, in particular, to plant our potatoes. Um, they're very easy because then when it comes time to harvesting the potatoes, I literally just dump out the sack and it becomes a little like an egg hunt. So um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun for that. Uh, if, you have, if you go to the nursery and you get a flat of veggies, uh, uh, don't get into the habit of monocropping. Um, in containers, it's, you can get away with it because it's, it's a container, so it's, it's not going to do too much damage, but it's much better. As you see here, a few years back, I got a plat and I just shoved them all into one container and didn't even think about it. Um, it worked out, um, but uh, it is much better um, to mix in the beneficials and, I mean, to mix in the, um, uh, the herbs and the flowers and to break up that flat which you know if you get a flat of six you know you can make three nice containers and put you know two of each in each container throw some herb and and flowers and it will look it will look a lot nicer um and and it, and your
plants will benefit from having the herbs and the flowers in with that. Um, beneficials, uh, depending upon what specifically you're using, and my next chat here in a few weeks on the 28th, I'll be discussing this very topic on polycultures. Um, so I get into it a bit more than, than I do tonight, but um, there's a lot of benefits uh, from a standpoint of it, herbs act as um, they'll, they'll either distract certain bugs from plants, so, um, you know, and they'll save your plants from that. Chemically, uh, certain plants react in being planted in the garden or container together. Uh, they will chemically enhance each other's flavor. So, so take um, tomato and basil. Great on the plate, right? Well, it's just as it's really good in the garden or a container together because chemically they do something in the soil that it actually does enhance the flavor as opposed to if they were planted separately. This is an example of a polyculture um, where I simply just took two varieties of lettuce, this is red sale and black seeded Simpson, and put them in the container. And even though it's a, a container full of lettuce, I did not monocrop because they're two different varieties. So it's as simple as that. If you go to the nursery and you get a couple of flats of something, just mix them, you know, mix them all together um, as opposed to going, okay, here's, here's this and here's that. We've been very successful with growing um, tomato plants in containers. Uh, this is an example of how the plant got so big that I needed to, one, move it, and then two, I needed to strap it to the house because it got so big. <laughs> and it was a great problem to have. It's actually a grafted plant. This is a, um, the grafted plants, if you're not familiar with them, they take the top of one plant and the bottom of another, the roots, and they graft them together so that they actually grow together. And then um, you get the best of both of those plants. This was a grafted um, sweet million with a um, sun gold. So we got an array of colors from red to the oranges. There were thousands of sweet cherry tomatoes, and um, it was quite delicious. You can't save the seeds from grafted plants, though. It won't come out the same. But they're quite fun to play with and quite delicious. When arranging your containers, play with the colors, the colors of the flowers, the leaves, the containers themselves. Play with the textures and the different materials. There's woods, there's resins, there's clay, there's stone, there's plastics. Don't forget about adding fruit to your container garden. Um, we love to plant strawberries in barrels and in containers. Hanging baskets are a great way also to go for strawberries and many other edibles. Tower garden. Our tower garden over here, this is an aeroponic soilless system. For those people who like to keep their hands clean and don't want to bend, this is the way to go. Um, it's an air and water system. There's no soil. It's a vertical growing system. It only takes three square feet of space. Uh, it recycles the water from the basin, saving on water usage. It requires a little bit of electricity to run the pump, but it uses very, very little. It holds 20 plants, and they have extension kits, so you can continue to go higher. The baskets hold the plant, and the rock wool envelops the seeds from with some vermiculite uh, from which the plant takes root and grows. It's an eco-friendly system which uses very little space and healthy plants grow from an incredible root system which develops. The aeroponic growing system reduces the need for pesticides and excess insecticides and herbicides. It's an all natural, the all natural earth minerals in liquid form produce strong healthy plants that can better protect themselves from plant pests and diseases and because it's soilless, it is not subject to ground pests. The aeroponic system 
cuts our, car our carbon footprint by recycling natural resources, potentially reducing pesticide use, and virtually eliminating the need to ship and store produce. In Chicago, the airport, O'Hare, there's 300 of these, and every restaurant is getting their produce from what's being grown in the airport. There's a restaurant in Manhattan called Bell Book and Candle down in Greenwich Village. And he has 30 of these on his rooftop. And he grows all of his fresh produce. And actually, I just saw a news story that he's opening a second restaurant in Washington, DC, uh, where he used the same um, system. So the Tower Garden, it, it grows beautiful food. Um, very quickly, I feel like sometimes in the morning, um, particularly when I'm starting the seeds and such, uh, I feel like sometimes I can actually see it growing. <laughs> I come down in my, in, with my coffee in the morning and I take a, a look at what's going on. And I swear, you know, there's days that I feel like, you know, the leaf that was this size in the morning all of a sudden is this size. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, because it's kind of exciting. Um, it's a great system. The food tastes just as flavorful as what comes out of your soil garden. There's no loss in flavor. It's getting the nutrients in a liquid form. It, that's the only difference. So. May I ask you a question? Sure. What makes this system uh, reduce the pesticide uh, why is the pesticide use? Um, less, oh no, I mean the, there are two of them. Yeah, why why you don't you why yeah, you're exactly. you using less pesticides? Well, basically, well one, you're not subject to ground pests. So right there, you've taken out um, you know a huge factor of potentially threatening pests. When you plant a tower garden, we recommend planting it just like you would a container, adding beneficial, um, adding um, companion plants, so mixing in herbs with the vegetables, with flowers. Um, in that organic process, what you're doing is you're using organic methods in order to combat um, the pests. So, Depending upon what I might put on the, the tower garden, um, let's say I put some squash plants, uh, I'd put in some nasturtiums as well, I would put in some rosemary, I would put in uh, some oregano as well, and not to mention I'd probably have some, you know, my tomatoes and everything else going on in there. But um, those plants will do the very same thing with the tower that they would in the garden. So if one plant acts as a deterrent plant, that would, um, you know, uh, deter, the, you know, a nasturtium does this for uh, squash plants. So instead of the plant, it, the, the, the bug going after the squash plant, it's going to be attracted to the nasturtium. So you use the same concept, and that's why you're not using as many um, pesticides or herbicides. Um, you know, when you're using the tower. Plus also, when you're fertilized, there's, it's a whole fertilization thing. You're in the water. Um, so you're going to use liquid nutrients. You're not going to, um, you're not going to use, need to, to use things um, that might in turn, you know, turn against your garden. You said the growing medium was basically vermiculite? It's rock, wool, and vermiculite. So. The rock wool, I don't want to get in the way, is this substance. And the vermiculite just kind of holds the seed into, um, into place at so first. You, you, so then you put that in, in the holder? Yep. Which is, okay. So you basically, when you start a garden, you would take, they come like this, you put it in here. You'd put, plant your seed in there. You'd put some vermiculite on top. That also just mm -hmm. also helps the moisture mm -hmm. stay there. And, um, and then you pop it into the garden, okay. you know, as such. So, oops.
There are other growing methods out there that you can use indoors and outdoors or, or all year long. Hydroponic uses a non-traditional growing me medium similar to the um, aeroponic system and liquid nutrients. Aquaponics combines hydroponics with aquaculture. Um, so the byproducts from the fish are used as the nutrients for the plants and they're recycled into the aquaponic system. This is becoming quite big in a lot of places and gardens and such. When you plant, all depends on what you're planting. Planting in, veg um, in containers gives you a little bit more flexibility, um, particularly in the start of the season. Uh, the, my containers that are outside will warm up a lot quicker than the soil in the ground, so I can get a jump on things. We have the tendency to, we start planting our peas and, and our cold weather crops um, shortly after St. Patrick's Day. You wanna be able to just, as long as you can work the top two inches of soil, then you can see. Cold crops will, they'll take uh, a, a light spring frost, so it's okay. Um, around tax day, when you see the dandelions blooming, that's when um, potatoes go into the ground, into the con into containers. And after Mother's Day, when we know we totally have no threat of a frost, your warm weather lovers, your big plants, your peppers, your tomatoes, they get into the um, into the containers and gardens at that point. You can plant a lot of crops throughout the season. If once you, you know, if you're planting a container of lettuce and stuff, you, you just keep reseeding and you'll have a continuous crop. Maybe you have two containers going, so as you got one, you time it, then you can have fresh greens throughout the season. Garlic is like any other bulb. Uh, it goes into the ground uh, in fall and over winters. Even using your containers outside, just because they're containers, you don't have to think of it any differently. So there are a lot of vegetables that overwinter. You can seed your containers, leave them outside for winter time, they'll be fine. Your vegetables will come up out of the containers early in spring, just like they would in a raised bed. Keep in mind, if anything needs support, um, you want to make sure that you provide the proper support structures. Uh, you need to make sure you, in those self-watering containers, they don't really self-water themselves, you need to make sure that the, the reservoirs are, stay full. Um, they do give you a little bit of leeway though, depending upon the container. These, these big containers have four gallons, so I found that um, particularly <coughs> during the really hot, uh, when we got like a, a a week of you know 90 degree days, not so much last this summer, but the summer before. Um, my plants were a lot happier, the ones that were in the uh, reservoir containers versus the other ones. Um, you also want to make sure you prune your plants. Um, as I said, pruning allows the air in, it keeps diseases out as well. Um, and always take a look for, for insects and, and whatnot. If you see a, um, a bug, just pick it off. It, things can happen in containers just the same way as it can happen in a raised bed or a regular garden. Um, people think, well, it's in a container, how'd that happen? Um, they find their, you know, hornworms find their way. They, you know, it just happens. Growing vertical these days has become a lot easier. There's new technology out there that's emerged that makes these challenges um, easier for us to, um, to face. Uh, they allow us um, the advantage to be able to take advantage of that sunny blank wall that might be in the patio, or maybe there's a sunny wall inside the house. Um, you know, there's a new product, it's called the Woolly Pocket, uh, which we are starting to play around with. Author and teacher Phyllis Thoreau said, I think this is what hooks one to gardening. It's the closest one can come to being present at creation. I couldn't agree more. To me, every time I plant a seed and I watch it sprout from the ground and eventually it grows to be a beautiful plant that produces fruit that I'm able to take and feed my family, it's, 
I get excited it's a miracle. Um, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, Mother Nature can be mean and she can rain on us too much and wash our seeds away or the birds come up. Things happen. But it's something that to me is, is it's a, great, um, it's a great life lesson. It's taught me patience. Uh, I'm a lot more patient person <laughs> than that now. Um, growing fruits and herbs and vegetables I, can be so rewarding and simple to do. Whether you're planting a small herb container garden or larger containers with a mixture of delicious vegetables, fragrant herbs, and beautiful flowers. The act of gardening is so healthy for our bodies, minds, and souls. Big or small, it will bring forth delicious harvest for all of us to enjoy. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. If anybody has any questions about anything, we can certainly answer them. Um, please feel free to come up and take a look at any of, um, of our, our, our things here. And we have some material in the back. Um, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, you talked about putting compatible um, plants mm -hmm. with your garden. And how do you go about finding compatible? Okay, so with, um, there's, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, Give, make sure you send me your email and I can send you a list of things of companion plants. Um, as I said, on the 28th I'll be speaking again and we'll be going over that exact subject. Oh, okay. um, so that there are certain plants that um, play nice together, but in the same sense, there are a lot of plants that don't play nice together. Yeah, right. So yeah, know, it's yeah. certainly something to consider <coughs> and to learn a little bit about because Sometimes somebody will be like, oh, I don't understand why this happened. And then I'll talk to them a little bit more and be like, well, what was around it? And then you find out he, he, they were in the playground with, you know, enemies. So, um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? I have a question. It may be very basic. But sure. when you talked about reseeding lettuces, mm -hmm. I've never planted a lettuce. So how do you actually, where do you, how do you get the seeds? Okay, well. It's very simple. There's, there's online, there's tons of different resources for getting seeds. In town, you could go to Weed and Dore, they've got seeds as well. But uh, organic seeds, which is what I recommend, there's, uh, you can simply do a Google search and Johnny Seeds, Annie's, uh, you'll get a whole uh, array of. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant after you yield your lettuce, you were saying you could re. Yes, yeah, so you can recede from your existing. Oh, receding from that's your right. existing lettuce that's is right. very, very difficult. Okay, um, so that's not you can right. let it bolt. Like lettuce, when it grows, if it overgrows, it will start to bolt. And when bolting happens, it starts to shoot straight up. If you wait long enough, you can get uh, seeds from it. But Getting seeds from lettuce okay. is nothing. I would not recommend that to a new gardener because it would be a frustrating thing. Yes? I have a question about the sprouting. Um, you mentioned about rinsing it, and I see the, saw the screen on the top. You said always yep. have it in a draining position. Yes. The bottom, the bottom has no holes in it. No, so you're going to have it upside down. This is, um, oh, okay, I got it. this is an example of you can get these tops. They don't cost that much. But you can make a top this as easily. And so if you just mix it, you use the top. When you put it in the sink, you want to have it like this. You want to make sure that all of your seeds don't land up blocking this area, because that will keep the air from coming in. So you want to kind of like <coughs> shake it out so it's like half like this. Oh, OK. Probably won't be as full as I have with this. So it's that the air is getting in and the, the liquid's draining out. So, and sprouting's a lot of fun because it's, it's a great thing to do. It's very, as I said, it's very nutritious, but. Um, About 40 years ago, I had, my kids were little something called a bio snacky. Yep, they have, they do have things that but you is can that go. still around? Yes, they, they have bigger things that you can go. If you get really into it, that give you a little bit more of um, an area to grow in. And you can also use that for uh, the microgreens as well. It's nice because if you don't want to mix them, you have three layers. If you want the mustard to stay separate. Exactly. Layers. Yes. They do have all sorts of things. There's so many different things on the market. Uh, this is a quick, easy, do-it-yourself way to do it. You can even do it in a burlap sack. If you have like this little tiny burlap sack, you do it the same way. You just hang it from a knob on the kitchen sink and let it drain. And 
And that I did when I was really easy. Um, so, so, yeah? You talked about pruning. Yes. Uh, how do we know how, what to prune? If it's pr there's fruit on it, what could be? It's okay to prune. People get scared, scared of pruning. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a type of thing. When I, when I look at a plant, when I go to prune it, um, as I said, that one plant that I, I, I showed you, I couldn't see through that plant originally. It kept on catching the wind. It was so dense. So when I approach a plant to prune, um, are you familiar with the term with what a sucker is? Yes. Okay, so you know that. So that would be the first place that you would look to go and take all the suckers off. But then after that, what you do is you look at the plant and you follow where the if if the, the there's a limb that's got fruit on it, stay away from that. You're gonna find ten others that don't, and it's those that you start taking off. Because as the plant starts to develop, what pruning also does is it starts directing the energy of the plant right into the fruit. So by taking off the extraneous arms that are just foliage, um, you're getting rid of where you know energy is being sent. Don't worry about, well, some people go, you know, well, those th it's keeping my plant from getting burned or too much sun or what, no, no it's not. Take the plant, take the limb off. You know, follow it. I mean, sometimes you know I, I'll I'll miss and you know I'll be like, oh no, I just took off and it, it had you know some flowers on it or something. So you know, be careful when you're going in, but you want to just follow where which which plants are not. You know, if it's just a limb with leaves on it and it doesn't have fruit and it doesn't have anywhere that it's going to flower, then take it. So you, you suggest for us to take the whole limb off, rather yep. than tip of a... Uh, yeah, if you want to start closer in because you're scared, go ahead. <laughs> you know, just come in. It's like getting a haircut. I recently took eight inches, nine inches off of my hair. So the first time I, I let the woman just go in and, <laughs> go and take the whole eight inches as opposed to, okay, I'll see you in a couple of months and we'll take another two. But if initially you're, you know, a little bit fearful, it's better to take off it's better to take something off than not. Um, some people think that um, with the, uh, is everybody familiar with the difference in determinant tomatoes and indeterminate de tomatoes? A determinant de tomato, the plant blooms everything all at once. A lot of saucing tomatoes are, are determinants. Indeterminates will give you tomatoes throughout you know, as soon as it starts to, to bloom, which could be in July, and will start producing and continue to produce until that first frost. So that's the difference. Whereas the determinant, it just has one big grandiose blooming and um, fruiting. So some people think they shouldn't be pruning their determinant to t tomatoes. Um, I have not found that to be true. Personally, I mean, every gardener has their little things. So I, I find that my plants are just as productive. It hasn't kept, it hasn't done anything to the productivity. Um, and as I said, you have to make sure the other thing to look at is, is the air coming through? Is there a, is there a place on that tomato plant where you know, everything's all crunched together? You kind of weed through it, kind of look and see. You know, and sometimes when these things are growing up, all of a sudden, like, you know, the, the, you know, these things all of a sudden start bending in all sorts of ways and you've got, you know, the same thing has gone like this or something, you know, kind of like, kind of go through it, kind of make, you know, help it stretch its, its leaves and arms out and see, okay, well, you're not doing anything. You don't, you don't have any flowers or, or anything going on except for leaves. I can, I can take you off, you know. I start really pruning, when do you think we start pruning, like July? Probably around July. I let everything get kind of big and dense, and then depending upon, you know, if all of a sudden I find the <laughs> container is like flat on the ground because we had a windstorm, and it's like, okay, I'm gonna start to do something. And also, you don't worry about pruning the roots also when you are transplanting? When I transplant, I, I literally, when I transplant, I take, 
uh, whatever it is, I'm it, most of anything that I start it in is in a cow pod or something that I don't have to take it out. So I plant it into the bigger, you know, I go right in, I'm not touching the roots, I'm not, I'm not doing anything like that. It goes right in, I pack the soil around it. What about the ones you buy from store? Sometimes you bring them home and you notice that it's really packed. Yes, well when you get, when you get them from the, the nursery and they've been like root bound yes. and everything, yes. you want to break those apart a little bit um, you know, ag again, let you want to help stretch those roots out. So they've been like stuck, and they can't. Even if you leave them like that, they're not gonna. It's gonna take them a while. It's like you know, think about when you're on a car trip for like ten hours and you get out of the car and you're like, oh my god, I can barely move. It's the same kind of thing. So just take your fingers, work it around a little bit. Um, if you don't want to go, I d I don't have a problem going right from the little flats. I mean, I'll seed directly into these things. So I'll just put it in, you know, everything looks a little barren and, you know, like there's a lot of space there at first, which I think initially when I first started, I used to over cram. Um, you see a lot of landscapers doing that because they want a nice finished product. And then a few years later, you gotta go in and start splitting things. Um, leave the room in the container because it will grow into that container. Are there any other questions? Well, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. It was a pleasure to talk with you tonight and share our passion for gardening and container gardening. Um, on the 28th, as I said, I'll be doing um, another talk here on polycultures, which is companion 